KNON 89.3 FM in Dallas and Fort Worth, the voice of the people. Business owners, tell KNON's listeners about your business. You can put your business or event on KNON. KNON currently has space available to run announcements for you. Tell KNON's listeners about your goods, services, nightclub, concert, or event. Help keep the voice of the people on the air while putting your information on the air. KNON's been named the number one radio station in Dallas by both the Dallas Observer and D Magazine. Put your business with Dallas's number one station. Call now for more information at 214-828-9500, extension 227 or extension 233. For more information, go to KNON.org and click on the Run Spots on KNON page. It's a great way for your business to support community radio while letting more people know about you. Get off my lawn. What a game. What a game. Jim Shoots and Eric Celeste. Uh, back with Get Off My Lawn, the show that tells you what's really going on in Dallas. We have a uh, interesting and I- important uh, guest with us, Renee Martinez, who's the uh, director of the District 3 of uh, the League of United Latin American Citizens, LULAC. But uh, Mr. Martinez is well known in the community for many other things, goes way back in uh, political leadership, was part of the battle for a single member districts on the city council and so forth. I believe we're going to be talking about the uh, Dallas Independent School District again, a story that's back in the news on uh, in the morning news this morning. It was on Channel 8 again last night with Brett Ship. And the, que- the first question we're going to try to dope out here, Eric will help us with this, is what is this story all about? If I may, let me just lay down a little backstory. Uh, a year ago, Mike Miles came here to be our new school superintendent. He brought in all his own people at the so-called cabinet level. I don't know that I have ever heard that term before, but it, his cabinet is his... Uh, I mean, I have in the White House, but right. his cabinet is his top team. And over the course of the year, a bunch of those people have left. Uh, some were, I guess, bad hires. Uh, some left for reasons we never heard. But this uh, narrative built up, uh, especially in the news and on Channel 8, that they were leaving because of Miles, that he was some kind of bad guy. And, he, and these people were just leaving because they couldn't, work for him and uh what what's you know, every time another person left oh here's another nail in the coffin of mike miles so finally this guy leaves his name is eric smelker he was head of operations which is kind of in charge of uh the actual plant the buildings i think he had additional duties too but uh he was very determined and i talked to smelker when he left he, he was very determined to say, I am not leaving because of Mike Miles, and my colleagues didn't leave because of Mike Miles. We left because of the school board, the school trustees. And this gets into a, a bunch of issues. The, uh, Mike Miles is imposing a whole new regime on the district, a so-called reform regime. Some of the school board members are anti-reform they don't like it and so now they're anti mike miles they want to get rid of him and they've really been pushing this story i mean it's it's a it's even more double-edged than this they've been out bullying these in these school district employees uh, uh trustee bernadette not all was sort of caught because the employees complained about it uh, buttonholing these employees on their campuses saying you better not do what your boss the superintendent tells you to do you better do what I do so so they bully the employees and some of the top employees get sick of it and they quit and then the same trustees say look another one quit he can't hang on to his team so I think that's the background Eric what would you how and, it's, and you're right and I, I heard that first uh, about you know, a little before Smelk, a month or so before Smelker quit and wrote that everyone knows that not all and some others were part of that, but that a trustee named Elizabeth Jones was also a big part of this behind the scenes. And so uh, I wrote that. She went down demanding to 
figure out who my sources were. You were the first one to say, it's not all this reform stuff, it's Jones. It's Jones. And because a lot of people were, as I you know, saying, don't, don't sleep on Jones. There's, she's doing this right. too. And this was right when, and people, because when you leave a job, you don't want to burn the bridges on your way out right. uh, to another school district. They were telling uh, people and us and myself this um, uh, behind the scenes. So, um, and then shortly thereafter, about a month thereafter, Smelker quit. Right. And said, sort of, I need to make known that I agree with some of these, that this is really the problem. Right. And, and he told me that he's done with education. He's not looking for another job. Right. <laughs> so he was willing to lay it out. And so what has happened since then, um, it's all very complicated, and that helps this weird narrative that's developed because Miles is under an investigation that we've talked about that came about because of the Rene Rodriguez, uh, the uh, the Rebecca Rodriguez thing, which I think is bogus and and mm. so forth. And I think we think Coggins will say this is bogus. Um, but during that, they've said, well, we've found out, we've we figured out, and we're leaking this to the Morning News and to Ship at Channel Eight that. Um, there was that Smelker's letter was reviewed or rewritten, or they've tried to sort of say heavily influenced by, and this was really an attack on Elizabeth Jones, right? Um, and and they've tried very hard to say this happened while she was a district employee, while, while, while Lisa Lamaster, the PR person, was taking money from the district. So that in effect, she was taking money from the district as a contract employee and helping people leaving the district write a letter criticizing the school board which as i said last week if that happened more power to her that's really awesome but the but no. but it didn't the thing is and it may have but you can't prove it because she the the date of the emails they have that ha show her involvement are after she was off the the um the payroll of the district so they're getting into all of this watergate uh let's let's find the documents let's yeah. prove a link to this when none of that matters it, none of it matters I, this is the main <laughs> point and i'm probably going to just start ranting and raving it doesn't matter that uh and uh, by the way w we were wrong last week it's it's clear now um that lamaster didn't toned down his letter she tried to get him to name jones specifically she's the one who said don't <laughs> just hint at who this is say it and that was what her rewrites yeah. did he went back and said no i'm not going to do that and toned it back down where it didn't name her specifically again none of that matters the point is if you read his original letter okay right it says this ha uh, the a meeting on june 13th was the straw that broke the camel's back that's the one that jones spent criticizing right. and haranguing him so it was her yeah he says, the fundamental problem here is that I'm leaving and the other people who are good educators who want to do right by the district are leaving because they're being meddled with, because the school board is, uh, is out of control, certain members of the school board, and that means good people will leave and good people will not take a job in the district because of the Dallas school board, and that is the story. Here. And, and so instead we have this crazy story. I think it's crazy from and Brett Ship, who's a guy I respect and like, but this crazy story lately from Ship and in the news that the letter is somehow fake, that <laughs> Smelker didn't really mean any of that, right. that that's not really a problem. The news stories and <laughs> Ship stories have never gone back to that June 13 meeting right. that he talked about. I went back and, <laughs> and listened to it, and it's crazy. Jones is is is. Uh, subjecting this guy and other top uh, 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 personnel to this interrogation. The problem with the interrogation is that you cannot figure out what she's talking about. And at, at two points in the meeting, two other trustees say, they try to intervene, and they say, Elizabeth, we can't tell what you're asking. And instead of saying, okay, here's what I'm asking, then she goes off into this sort of hippie speech. Well, I'm just trying to get my head around things. Well, how do you, what is the answer to that? Yeah. Uh, and anyway, I, w this makes me crazy. And, and, and let me just, I, and I want to get Renee's take on this very soon, but let me just read from the original letter he wrote that Lisa went and started editing and tried to make a little more right. pointed and it would have been a little more newsworthy because she called out certain people's mm -hmm. names i can see what sh what she was trying to do 
But this is from his letter, and this to me is the crux of it. It says, um, and there's a little bit of, you know, of, of genuflecting towards Miles at the beginning. Right. Mike, your, Mike, your leadership, courage, and passion for kids leveraged by an effective staff and a supportive functioning board would be tremendous assets for the students, community, and staff of the Dallas Independent School District. That's not the situation. Although previous voluntary departures of cabinet members were not explained out of respect for the district, I can confidently say that most of those resignations were linked to the extraordinarily difficult working relationships, or lack thereof, with several of the trustees. Quite simply, while cabinet members admire your, your tenacity and vision, many do not want to continue working in an environment where select members of the Board of Trustees behave in a dysfunctional and disrespectful manner. Not only are the trustees unable to operate appropriately and effectively as a policy-making board, some of them are often hostile and belittling toward dedicated and talented professionals and staff who often are here at great personal cost to their careers and families. That is the story. The, uh, okay, now I, I'd like to go to uh, Renee Martinez. We uh, because the other th- th- that right. What Eric just <laughs> read to you is the story, but the story that you see in the morning news today is this weird stuff about the external investigation. Paul Coggins, former U.S. attorney, is investigating. According to the Dallas Morning News, he's investigating whether or not. Lisa LeMaster edited Smelker's letter. And the only guy I know who's actually spoken to the Coggins people and has been part of this investigation and has participated in it and contributed to it, uh, the, the only one I've heard talk about it is you, Renee. What do you... What did you talk to Coggins about? What, you know, what is the investigation about as far as you know? I thought the investigation was dealing with the RFP process. I thought the investigation was dealing with the role of staff in that RFP process. I thought the investigation was dealing with OPR. Uh, that was Office of, the Office uh, Office of Professional, of Professional uh, Responsibility. Uh, that was 90% of my time uh, that I discussed with the Coggins staff. Uh, and as I stated to the media later when I was pressed by by Brett and uh, and Matt Haig about my conversations regarding my relationship with Lisa LeMaster, that was less than 60 seconds. Uh, they, w- they really were not interested in that. They just said, hey, what do you, what, have you ever worked for? You worked, no, not, not whatsoever. I've known her since so 1989. The, so the Coggins people weren't asking no, you about no, who, who no. added whose letters. They wanted to know a lot about the RFP process, the players in that process, uh, the role of OPR, because I'd had experience with OPR, uh, then being judge and jury at the same time. No, OPR <laughs> is an internal investigative unit within the school district that sort of yeah. kicked this all up. Exactly. And so I had personal experience, and I cited all my personal experience. But to Eric's point about board members, uh, there's another young man <clears throat> who came to the district from Garland. His name is Rene Barajas. Uh, I got to meet Rene at one of the... Uh, uh, chorizo menudo functions of Lulac when he arrived. Bright young guy from Garland became the CFO. Uh, had a chance to talk to him. Uh, a lot of us in the Hispanic community, like we were also excited about Rebecca Rodriguez yep. coming to to uh-huh. EISD. We were excited about Renee. Uh, th- I had talked to some of the Lulac folks in Garland, and they said, "Oh man, he's a rising star. Y'all stole him from us." Well, fast forward three months later. He's gone. And so I called my sources in Lulac and Garland and said, can you find out why he left? And guess what it was? Exactly what Eric just said. Yeah. Board interference. He was a CFO. and he In was charge of the money. In charge of the money. And he got rattled. He got upset. Uh, board members crossing the line in terms of, again, this is fundamental. Board members getting into administrative issues versus policy issues. And he said, life's too short. I don't well, I don't need this. I have a great job in Garland and I can go help kids and educate kids and not have this sort of interference. I That's I've never correct. I never succeeded in reaching him. Uh, the story I got, tell me if you've heard this from pretty decent sources was that board members were coming to him with suggestions about how to count the money. Absolutely. Absolutely. And 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 again it was crossing that line and 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 you know I've been involved with the school boards since 1971. Uh, I'm I'm uh, a little older than you guys, and and I've seen that. 
I, I haven't seen it across the board with a whole bunch of board members, but every tenure of board members, there's always an individual or two individuals that don't seem to understand what governance is all about. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they don't, or they don't want to. Yeah. They cross the line like nut all and gets into directing staff, telling staff of that, about her. They think they're the boss of the they, staff. No, they think they are running the school district. Yeah. Instead of understanding that they can only talk to certain staff people via the superintendent. That's that's the yeah. procedure. And I had that same experience before I retired from the school district. Oh, I didn't mention that uh, Renee Martinez was a school district executive for a number of years. And we are, what was the area you were working I, I, Over the period of 20 years, I was an assistant principal. I was a director of parent engagement. I was in emergency operations. And I was in communications. Okay. But, again, the fundamental problem is governance versus administration. And we've had, over the past 30 or 40 years that I've been involved with the school district, board members that turn to, uh, you know, they, they, they go off their own little pathways yeah. and get involved in the, in the minutia of trying to be super superintendents. But now it's really serious because you got this superintendent who's come in and he said, we're changing up everything. We're changing the way we do business. We're changing the whole uh, dynamic here. And you've got board members who are going out to stay and saying don't do what he tells you and Jim, and Jim there's the the sad thing is you've what you've got is an alliance between some people who are anti-reform right but then I've been told by people who've talked to her and know her people who gave her money for her campaign Elizabeth Jones just doesn't like Mike and has decided I want this guy out that's not even a that's not even a, a an anti-reform sentiment it's just she has dug her feet in on this Ha okay, we'll be uh, back after the break. Uh, Jim Shoots, Eric Celeste with Renee Martinez. See you in a minute. owners, tell KNON's listeners about your business. You can put your business or event on KNON. KNON currently has space available to run announcements for you. Tell KNON's listeners about your goods, services, nightclub, concert, or event. Help keep the voice of the people on the air while putting your information on the air. Put your business with Dallas's number one station. Call now for more information at 214-828-9500, extension 227, or extension 233. For more information, go to KNON.org and click on the Run Spots on KNON page. It's a great way for your business to support community radio while letting more people know about you. When they're gone, they're gone for good. This is Scott from KNON's Texas Blues Radio telling you don't miss out on some great blues. KNON's Texas Blues Radio Volume 5 Blues CD. It's a CD put together by real blues fans for real blues fans like you. Texas Blues Radio Volume 5 features great local blues from Michael J. and the Paul Bird Band, J.J. and the Detonators, the Chris Watson Band, the Two Tones, Rough Cut Blues Band, Jeff Stone with Charlie Love, Dave Millsap, Sir Loin and the Ass Kicking Machine, Tutu Jones, Blues Boy Bo, Buddy Whittington, Andrea Dawson, Kirkland James, Sonny Colley, and Johnny Red and the Roosters. Get a copy now at Forever Young Records in Grand Prairie, Record Town in Fort Worth, and in Dallas at Bill's Records. This is a Dallas Blues Collector's Item. A very limited amount of vinyl copies can be found at Forever Young Records, the sponsor of this great blues project. CD downloads are available at cdbaby.com. Whether you get it as a download, on vinyl, or on CD, all the proceeds will benefit KNON. For more info on Texas Blues Radio Volume 5, visit KNON.org. Get off my lawn. We're back. Eric Celeste with Jim Schutz. Renee Martinez here uh, talking to ISD. We've got a caller on the line uh, who has a question. Tony on line one. Tony, are you there? Yes. How are y'all doing this morning? Doing well, Tony. Thanks. All right. Now, you know, I, I agree with most everybody on the panel is talking about, but the reality is this, is that everybody always hears about the kids. And at the end of the day, it's not. Because you wouldn't be, you wouldn't be paying people $100,000 to do the job they're doing. And everybody's fighting over this pie, which blacks are fighting over, 
Hispanics are fighting over and whites are fighting over. It's about the money. And and one thing is, when, yes, you got Brendan all for taking the black interest. I don't know what the lady in North Dallas is doing, but Renee is for taking the Hispanic interest. And, and it's not about the kids. The kids are the ones, no matter, in this whole conversation, is being cheated. Period. And, 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 and what we do is we talk from a 25,000 feet level and then we say, okay, what, you know, yes, yeah, Mike Miles is head of the organization. But one thing he, you got to do is make alliances. And granted that the business class want him in, in play. Well, but, the reality, at, but at, at, at the end of the day, he's not going to be here five, six years down the line. Name me the last lieutenant, last 10 years here, 20 years. You're not going to have that anymore. It's about interest and about the money. It's about the dollars. And I'll leave y'all with that. Tony, that. Tony, thanks for... Cohen and and we all, and people always do say it's about the kids. I agree, it's about the kids. It's also about the adults. It's about the young adults. I interview standing on a corner in this city, uh, young men in their late thirties, early forties, at uh, three in the afternoon, uh, uh, smoking dope, uh, drinking forty ounces, who should be uh, lawyers, teachers, businessmen. Uh, instead, they've fallen out or been kicked out of DISD illiterate at age 16 got into some drug stuff got shipped into the the prison system now they're illiterate ex-cons and they can never work and we have tens of thousands of people who are left in this position in life they are shut out of productive life and the one window we have to get to get into that and to save the children who are headed in that direction is the school system. Tony, l let me also add, I, I'm not, as LULAC director, which is the largest civil rights organization for Hispanics in the nation, uh, I don't just advocate for Latino kids. Uh, but I do, since we have a void on the school board without any Latino representation, and I'm not saying I'm a school board member, which I am not, but Latino parents and Latino kids are, have been disenfranchised and are disenfranchised as we speak, number one. Uh, number two, there's major changes going on within the leadership level, not, not just administratively, but at the campus level. Uh, how could you uh, defend a school administration that only had two principals either removed uh, last year with the scores that they had last year? Uh, fast forward this year. 55 new campus administrators, and if you look at the numbers, at least the data that's been released at the state level, uh, there's a lot of student growth, but 55 now new changes. So, uh, you know, it's all about reform, but what does that really mean? And that's where I think a lot of people don't understand that, that we've had a patronage system in this school district. We have had a system that's protected individuals, adults, and lost sight about the kids and parents that are disenfranchised. And, and Tony, you're right. There are a couple things that you said that are, are right on when you said, you know, Miles needed to be better about alliances and understanding the political landscape here, uh, which he was not at first. And, and that has resulted in a situation where now you've got a divided board. And you basically have, I've been told by the people who do the sort of vote canvassing, you basically got two people left who haven't decided how they're going to follow Miles. Um, uh, you know, the uh, Dan, uh, the from East Dallas, I forget the Miche, the Miche. the tax attorney, yeah, a and and Eric Cowan, a and that you know the his fate right now is in their hands, and that's you know ho hopefully hopefully they're evaluating this in the way that they should be. The other thing though is when you say that there are you know there are there are good stories out there, there are interesting things happening um, that are not being covered. There was somebody who was interviewed this week by Marty Haig, the, the Dallas Morning News reporter, uh, a person at um, DISD. That person said, M Marty, this is not a story. Why, yeah. are you, why are you doing this? I'll get here are some great stories you guys should be covering that are fascinating going on at these because th these stories are and this person used that phrase, you know, it's about the kids. And Marty said, oh, this is why we do this, because we care about the kids. I don't, uh, I, these <laughs> reporters are not, everybody says that. right, everyone says that. They're, they're doing what the stories they think are the important stories for the district. I just disagree, and I think Jim yeah. does. You know, and Renee, I, I, I don't want to jump ahead too fast to another, I think this is the same subject. What's going on with Brett Shipp? I mean, can you share with us any of, of, of your 
dealings with Mr. Ship in the last uh, couple of weeks? Well, ironically enough, you know, Brett's dad was a very, very good friend of mine. Uh, Brett probably doesn't even know that. Uh, when in the 70s, when we needed access to the media, uh, Brett Brett's dad was the first guy as assignment editor at the Bert news, Ship at Bert Ship at, at, at Channel was a guy that we we would go to and say, "Hey, there's a story. Ramsey Muniz is in town. Cesar Chavez is in town, and he would allow." He gave us access, so I've got a long history with the Ship family, starting with his dad, and and I've got a lot of respect for Brett. But but yeah. lately he's kind of gone. And, and I, maybe let me explain to listeners: Brett Ship is an investigative reporter on Channel Eight. News. But but lately I, I I just feel he's he's as Eric said, he's on an agenda, uh, and I've told him a couple of times: Hey man, you're you're creating the news. I thought you were supposed to be reporting the news. Uh, Matthew Haig uh, on the morning news side, young man also knew his dad, uh, Marty Haig, and a and, uh, great guy. And, and I have a lot of respect for Matt. He's young. Uh, he's gaining experience. But he's also chasing uh, some stories and creating news instead of reporting news. Uh, I gave him and Tonell Hobbs, who's the other yeah. reporter of the news, an example of Burleson Elementary. Uh, every station has covered Burleson Elementary. A uh, situation in Pleasant Grove where a principal has been abusive and arrogant and mistreated parents and and for the past two years. 11, 4, 5, Aldea, Univision, Televisa, they've all covered it. Guess who hasn't covered the story? The, the Morning News and Channel 8. And, and I think they think this is an important story. I yeah. just think, I just don't, I disagree. I mean, yeah. it's, you know. Sure. I, I, I think it's a, I think it's, in the scheme of things, when you step back a, and say, is this important? What, what, what ultimately are we trying to prove here? That somebody wrote a letter, but it's an, you know, it's, it's not focusing on the con of the fact that somebody stepped out and said, this is why I'm leaving the district. Yeah. This is why everyone else is leaving the district. This is a fundamental problem, and your your school system will not be fixed until this is fixed. But it, but it also has this little twist in it that, and, and by the way, I'm listening to you talking about Brett Ship's dad and uh, Matthew Haig's dad. It's interesting in Dallas, people uh, are second generation news people in Detroit. When I started, people went into the news business at when they got kicked out of seminary. Uh, <laughs> it's different. But anyway. Uh, this all started when Rebecca Rodriguez, who's a, a news person, who was a former colleague of Ships, right. and was hired at the district. Which has been in every one of his stories. Oh, wait. No, it's not. I forgot. He hasn't mentioned that. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. they were colleagues. Yeah. Uh, he's a former colleague, and she, I don't know if we say she got canned or she quit. She got bounced out. She separated somehow from the district, and, and she was the source of this whole allegation about the contracting mess and so on. She's really at the center of this, and she has been very much in Mr. Ship's heart, has she not? Absolutely. I, absolutely. I, uh, uh, Brett told me at one time, he said, hey, uh, DIC is sorely going to miss Rebecca. Uh, I saw Rebecca as someone we had a lot of expectations for her in the Latino community. But Rebecca, you guys haven't talked about Rebecca's little comments about having friends in higher places. Oh, we, we, we <laughs> No, I know you have, yeah, yeah. but I'm just saying right now. <laughs> oh, uh, she threatened. And, uh, threatened and a few threats that she made. That, that um, she had friends in the media who ex would exactly, come back and, exactly. and make Miles pay. And exactly. right, he will regret this, or whatever the yeah. language was. And, and she succeeded. I think and, she succeeded. And it was in the report that, that caught, it was the in the, the big confidential or not confidential report uh, that was that that was leaked that not all uh, leaked and that um, it's you know all of the reporting from that was miles bullies Rodriguez etc and nobody said oh look two people in that same report said that Rebecca Rodriguez claimed she was going to get miles even but, even one of her subordinates who was supposed to be supporting her said that that she had made these threats and that uh, she, she said she told people at the district that uh, she left a much better job to take this job as head of communications at the district and I was thinking really being a reporter was I, I Maybe I didn't understand what her previous job was, but I did learn that she actually doubled her pay when yes. she went to the district. Rebecca, uh, Rebecca was way over her head. I've worked with a lot of communications chiefs throughout my 30 years of involvement. She was way over her head. She's a nice lady. Uh, she, 
Obviously, she couldn't manage uh, a lot of folks. Uh, she obviously did not know how to deal with the board. Uh, and, uh, you know, it was just a it was a bad hire. That's, that's all I can say. None of which would be we would be talking about if she hadn't brought this entire thing down. Yeah, these charges. Uh, what should we, Eric, what, what should we be talking about? You were talking about this at the top, and, and we've strayed away from it. What is the story here? I mean, I feel like there's this bottomless pit that you can fall into. You, there's this big black hole in the, in the, on the Metro page in the morning news, and if you fall into it, you'll never get out. Right. <laughs> but the, the story to me is, I, because I don't know the answer, which is why I would like stories on this to help me figure this out. What should this structure be to be a successful school district? How should the board act? How should the you know how much independence you know how much leeway should a superintendent have to execute the vision the board has and you know because this seems to be what we're arguing about miles shouldn't be you know getting emails about this person leaving who's criticizing board members they're his boss it's not a it's a you know it's 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 much more like um you see in a business and i've made this analogy before you know it's a it's a a board for a business right the, a, and a ceo and the ceo can certainly criticize the board and back and forth there's uh but but people seem to be really put out by that so renee what how should this in your mind what should the board be doing how should they be empowering the principal? How much should they be leaving alone? How much say should they have in policy? And Renee, let me add to the question before you answer. Not all and other trustees will say, I was elected to represent my, repres my constituents and to influence the district in their interests. So how should that be working? Well, I, I've worked with about <clears throat> probably about 15 superintendents since 1971, starting mm -hmm. with Nolan Estes. And uh, who I at many times I was, I was his pain uh, in the side, and then I, we became friends, and I consider him a mentor. Uh, I worked with a lot of superintendents, good ones, great ones, fair ones, uh, bad ones. Uh, same same way with board members. There's been board members when I when I was appointed to be on the triathlon committee with Zan Holmes, uh, John Plath Green, a corporate attorney who literally at that time. Uh, ran the school board, uh, attacked the triathlon committee, and said the federal judge has a has created a super school board, and we went to battle for about two mm. or three years. So the 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 uh, the type of board members that are elected uh, in in the in the past depended on two things. Number one, we had at large representation that changed when mm -hmm. the single member district situation changed. I think. The mentality and the process change, good and bad. Uh, that's when we got more of, well, I represent only the people in my specific area. My part of town. My part of town. And and that could be good and that could be bad, depending on how effective you're going to be. And I therefore care about these schools in this district, instead, and that's it. Instead of looking at, at, at for the good of the entire district. So you, we've had ebbs and flows on the type of board personalities that have been elected again like superintendents who have been selected good ones powerful ones backed by business grassroots folks and 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 we've gotten good ones in every one of those sectors i remember bill hunter who was a, a lawyer uh during the deseg process bill hunter was probably one of the most effective school board presidents this city has ever had because he, he really uh was was kind of moderate but he, he knew the difference between governance and administration. Going back to the superintendents, uh, you know, I think a lot of it, it depends on that superintendent in terms of how they know and they understand their, their trustees. You know, Hinojosa also had some trials and tribulations with some of his trustees. Rojas, nine months, he was gone. Mm -hmm. uh, Gonzalez, you know, was indicted, went to jail. And then we had people like Mike Moses, and Linus Wright, who really kind of figured it out, mm -hmm. and then they and and their tenure also was good. Mike Mike Moses' tenure was not long, but he was a guy that really figured it out in terms of that checks and balances between board members and the role of board members and and his role as superintendent. So, again, I think Miles 
is going to have to probably do a better job in his hires, but but they're his hires. They're not the board members' hires. And and that's where, when they start crossing the line, when you've got people like Nuttall, and, and I don't know Miss Jones very well, uh, other than uh, meeting her a couple of times, and I, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be optimistic with her. I hope that she gets it, hopefully. But others like Nuttall, they don't get it. They go back to the school of, this is my district. I'm I'm only concerned with one part of town, and and I'm going to be telling uh, superintendents and assistant superintendents and principals what to do. And, and there needs, to, in my mind, what you're saying is that need to be able, like a good city council person does, to balance the needs of their district with the needs of the entire organization and organism that is DISD. And recognize, and I've told Ned all this and recognize the demographic changes. Uh, we are now going to be about 72% Latino population. When I got involved in DISD in 1971, it was 8%. Now, does that mean, what does that mean? It means that there's been a lot of changes. Big change. Big change, and we have to be cognizant of that. It doesn't mean that we have to forget about 20, 30, 40,000 African Americans. Absolutely not. They're all part of the district, or the the five to ten thousand Anglo students that are still out there. I think we, we have to think of all the kids. Before we go to the break, I think Eric has a sermon for us here. Uh, I, I do, uh, Jim. I have to talk about a little publication you may know in town. It's uh, kind of a left wing thing. It's. Give it away free because who knows how valuable it is. I'm kidding, of course. I worked there for five years. The Dallas Observer, uh, their best of uh, voting is going on now. Uh, KNON has been nominated again for the third year in a row for the Dallas Observer's best radio station in 2013. So be sure, if you like, this, if you like what you're hearing, and of course you do. Why would you be listening if you didn't? Uh, go vote. Go vote for KNON. Go to the DallasObserver.com. Do it on your on your computer. Go to your, on your smartphone. Uh, I'm not going to plug your app. I'm not going to do that. All but right. uh, but <laughs> red, <laughs> um, but uh, go there. Register your vote for KNON for best radio station. You can vote once a day till the uh, September 9th, um, uh, in a in a couple in a week and a half or so. So go vote. And I think these elections are monitored by Jimmy Carter. So <laughs> it's all on the up and up. We'll be back after this break. If it's time to get rid of your old gas guzzler, the KNON Vehicle Donation Program can help. There's still a market for those old vehicles, and if you donate it, you're helping to support quality programming here on KNON. Just call 877-KNON-AUTO or go online to KNON.org. We'll take care of everything from pickup to tax paperwork. That's 877-K-N-O-N-A-U-T-O or online at knon.org. Sweet 16, Louisiana Red, and I'm celebrating my 16th anniversary on KNON, Saturday, September the 21st, at the Sons of Herman Hall, with my good friend, T.J. Hooker Taylor, son of Dallas Blues legend Johnny Taylor, the hit maker, Little Jimmy in the Feedback Band, and James White, you answer my cell phone button. Doors will open at 7 p.m., music at 8 p.m. I'll be DJing and MCing with that down home blues and soul mix. So come on out and party with me. Tickets are available now at KNON.org. Bill's Records in Dallas, Forever Young Records in Grand Prairie. The Sons of Herman Hall is located at 3414 Elm Street in Dallas. That's T.J. Hooker Taylor, Lil' Jimmy, and the Feedback Band, James Butler, and a big party at the Sons of Herman Hall, celebrating 16 years of Louisiana Reds, Down Home Blues and Soul Mix on KNON, the voice of the people. This is a KNON benefit. Sponsored in part by Beneficial Consultant Services, LLC. Hey, babes, I take one.
Jim Shoots, Eric Celeste, back with uh, Get Off My Lawn. Our guest is uh, Renee Martinez. And uh, I, uh, uh, we, uh, during the break is when we seem to talk about all the best stuff. <laughs> we got to turn this around. Uh, but uh, uh, during the break, we, we, we talked about uh, what, again, this goes back to the real story here. The original story, uh, this was all about an investigation of Superintendent Mike Miles. Did he illegally uh, uh, interfere with a contracting process and there was this internal uh, division within the district the office of professional responsibility that seemed to raise a bunch of questions about it they produced this report that if you looked at it closely it didn't really have any conclusions but it but it it, it sort of threw a lot of stuff at the wall and so it was decided that the, uh, the district needed to get somebody outside the district to kind of investigate the investigation, which is a sad comment on the investigation. Okay. But you got to pay an outside lawyer a hundred grand to look at this investigation and tell you, what is this? So that's what uh, former U.S. Attorney Paul Coggins and his staff have been doing for several weeks. Um, we all... we. Uh, Eric Celeste, a uh, columnist at uh, D Magazine. Me, Jim Schutz, I'm a columnist for The Observer. Renee Martinez, who's in the middle of all of this as a former school district executive, but also uh, District 3 director of LULAC and a guy who's involved in all of these politics. We all hear some stuff about what's going to happen with this investigation. So, Eric, let me start with you, then we'll go to Renee. When this is all said and done, what's Coggins going to come back and tell the... Well, I, you know, you're asking me that, and I just listened to the Freakonomics podcast about predictions. Yeah, and how, right. And how <laughs> awful it is to do so. But what the, my takeaway from that was, when you make a prediction, make it bold, because it's yeah. okay to be wrong. But if you're right with a bold prediction, they'll remember that. Yeah. But they'll forget if you were wrong. Right. So that's what I'm going to do. I... I you know, I was told, I don't know, a week ago or so, uh, some people who are, who are um, work for DISD in a certain capacity, that they think there may be, you know, they're not sure what they're going to come back uh, in terms of talking about the convoluted uh, situation there, the, the, the internal politics of bids and who should, you know, should Miles have, ta have, have pushed that off at the last minute uh, of the of the agenda because uh, probably not just because it looks bad I mean I don't know that that's the sort of thing I think that he's gonna come back with I think he's gonna say look tighten up these procedures put in some rules so that this doesn't happen again so there's not these gray areas and you know get get th this is a really you have a lot of eyes on you tighten up right um, but does that mean he bullied does that mean he um, did something unethical or illegal I don't think he's gonna say that and then what will happen though is there will be a combing of what the re his final report is right and that combing will be looking for things that can be brought out highlighted and used against him by the people who w are desperate to use this investigation to run him out right uh during another break Renee you told me something that I haven't seen in the news it was disturbing there's a petition drive already? <coughs> I'm, well, I heard there was. Uh, a friend of mine, uh, Bill Betson, uh, who is a good guy, good statistician, uh, sent me a note last night saying there was a petition drive. And we've been sharing emails saying, hey, you, you know, Bill, you're going to the dark side. Uh, <laughs> you're, you're supporting people that yeah. are supporting, uh, going back to a patronage system. So, you know, that's just another movement. But uh, let me give you my bold prediction. I think the Cowboys are going to go 11-4. <laughs> no. That is the most insane thing we've uh, said that, today. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Eric, you said be bold, okay? I, uh, uh, no, no I, I, I'm just joking. And, and, you know, we have to have a sense of humor in, in a lot of this. Yeah. And I, I've tried to do that with, with Brett and with Matthew Haig. And if, if, if we don't have a little bit of sense of humor and... And respect for each other, you know. We're, we're, you know. I don't know. Always agree, agree with you, Jim. Well, yeah. Uh, uh, over the past thirty. Well, now wait a minute. <laughs> 30, 40 years. Uh, I, I agree with Eric. Give me a percentage. Uh, uh, I think. I think. Um, 
uh, it's going to be a procedural issue that's going to be brought up. Maybe procedures weren't followed according to what they were. I would hope that the report also addresses the role of OPR. Uh, because, right. uh, as I told uh, Cogginstad, well, this is the internal yeah, division. Yeah, that is goes. that <clears throat> that organization uh, sees itself as an HR department, sees itself as the outside cop, sees itself as GAO, sees itself right. as the Office of Inspector General, and you know that initial report was allegations. Yeah, it wasn't a report, and and I I cited to them examples that I went through. I went through two OPR investigations. They were all, you know, taken care of and and based on uh, anonymous phone calls. Right. And I, and I had to spend the time to protect my my prestige, my integrity on anonymous phone calls. And you're you're exactly right that it w I hadn't hit on that, but now that you said it, it crystallized. When you read that report, it was it was just a sprawling. Uh, unveil the notebook account of everyone we talked to. It's not we talked to everybody, we brought our expertise to bear, we've filtered that, and we've given you yeah. what we think this means, which is what a report would be, what we, I think Coggins will be. And Jim, you've done, I, um, I, I don't know much about that department, you've done some reporting on it and, and heard some of the same things, right? Yeah, and it's sort of a rogue department there. They've been lobbying to be taken out from under the superintendent and be a independent under the school board. So far, the school board said no. Uh, so now it's like they don't it, they don't know who their boss is. Let me say this. Now that I've, I have encouraged both of you to predict uh, the outcome of the Coggins report, I would never make such a prediction. <laughs> I think that's very foolish to, to uh, jump ahead and, and uh, uh, try to predict the future. But I want to say this. I, I want to... I don't want to kill the crow, but I, I want to find a great big dead crow somewhere and put it on a platter and have it ready because the only reason you pay a hundred grand to a former US attorney to investigate is you're gonna come up with law breaking right you're gonna come up with something really serious an offense that's worth a hundred grand to find where he says I, I did find this terrible stuff. I've had to forward my findings to uh, the Justice Department and the FBI. They're going to be knocking on Mr. Miles's door even as we speak. Or oh no, here they come into the meeting, Mr. Right. Miles. You need to put your put your wrists out for the cuffs because you're going up the river. That's the only way this thing is justified. If they come up with some kind of uh, daffy procedural minutia. As, as a cover story for why they did it, I want them walk into that meeting with that crow on a platter. But they won't be presented that way, Jim. You know that. I mean, that's what I said. When they're going to comb a report, there will, be, there will be problems Coggins will address. And we've said, we said for months before all this came down about all of the problems that, have, that are, are inherent in, the, in, in that big sprawling cauldron you know or that mess that that is uh you know because it, it, it just by its nature it's you can't get all the schools in line you can't get all the principals in line you do what you can you put in procedures to get as many of them on board and focused on educating kids you can, you can. always find a problem you can always find a problem it and doesn't cost a hundred grand you don't have to have a former u.s attorney Right, and uh, but if the the other thing, the other thing that well, here's my other bold prediction, which I think is the the lock sol the lock of the week, um, is no matter if if it does come down that this was just procedural problems and there's recommendations of how to fix that, there will be a narrative spun on how this was compromised, and there will be you know that people. The, the Jim Schutzes and Eric Celeste of the world are in Mike Miles' pocket. Right. The, you know, well, the, those sort of people within the power structure here got to Coggins or made it impossible to find out what was really going on. You know, I get the sense when I read that news story, for example, about Lisa LeMaster and et cetera, if they feel like if we could just prove that she talked to Miles a day earlier yeah. when she was under contract. Then we'd have this story. <laughs> what would we have? And that brings us, I see our time running out. That brings us to a point, Renee, that I would like you to address. The, the suggestion in the news stories has been that 
early on when Miles showed up, you were critical of him. And then you turned around and you're supportive of him. And the news stories are clearly suggesting that you were paid to do that, somehow through Lisa Lamaster. Could you run down for us what your position was on Miles when he showed up and why you've whether how you feel about him now and why and why my position was eliminated when miles came in your job my job uh so i retired your school district my school district job i retired uh was i bitter uh a little bit but once i got my retirement checks i felt pretty pretty (laughs) good um yes i was critical i was very critical of of jennifer sprague who i thought like rodriguez was over her head uh, I was critical uh, in some of the initial meetings that a group of us had with Miles uh, through the Association of Hispanic Administrators when we asked him about bilingual lead. He wasn't too knowledgeable uh, recruiting a bilingual teachers. He wasn't too knowledgeable. And, and, and I was critical, and a lot of us were critical. And finally, uh, I'm not sure whether he reached out or I reached out, and he said, hey, let's talk. Because, uh, boy, I was shooting him and will continue to shoot him a lot of emails. Because nowadays that's the way you... Well, you're uh, retired. I, 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 right. I, don't think, I don't think you send letters anymore. Yeah. And, and, and we, we met. We had lunch. You and, and, and Miles. And, and how? what group? I mean, No, no one first. Oh, it was just oh, he oh, and I. He oh, wanted okay. me to come to the administration building. I said, heck no, I don't want to go to that, that building. I've spent too many days there. Yeah. So we had lunch. And we talked for about an hour and a half. And I reiterated my concerns about parent involvement, uh, bilingual teachers, the principal academy, which was at that time a thorn in our community. And, and then the, the conversation shifted. He said, what do I have to do to become a more effective uh, superintendent? I said, you have to show fallibility. You mm-hmm. really screwed up. And he started doing that. Then I, I invited him. I invited him to the Chorizo Menudo uh, breakfast. Uh, Domingo Garcia puts in Lulac. 250 Hispanic leaders were there. And he handled it really good. And then we followed up with a meeting of, of Lulac officers. And this time we did go to his office. And when he made the statement in that meeting, he said, look, I'm going to begin a process on evaluating principles. And some of you in this room are not going to like it. Because there's going to be some of your friends, people that you support, that are going to either retire, they may be removed, they may be fired. He's telling you. He's I'm telling us that that's what I'm going to start. This is in January. And everyone in that room said, we're behind you. Because if you make those changes and it's going to improve student achievement, we're supporting you. Regardless of whether they're black, Hispanic, or white. So at that point, we all kind of looked at each other and said, this guy's for real. And, and I've been told by people who know those principles would know some good principles got caught up in that. And hmm. that is and it is wrong and it is unfortunate and it I wish it had didn't happen. Yeah. But the attitude you're talking about that we've got to take these big steps and we've got to do drastic things if we're gonna yeah. move in the right way, it does take people to steal themselves for some of those missteps, some of those things that will happen where people get caught up in that. And that's the sort of big picture thing that that we've been talking about that's in, the important stuff that's going and, on here. And I, I, I don't want to make this just a media story, but that's, you're right, that is the big picture. And here's this, I think, very moving story that re- is told by Renee Martinez, who's as respected a- an authority on this sort of thing as you could find in the community of the Hispanic leadership of the city, at first very skeptical about Miles, then turning around, when Miles tells them to their faces, I'm going after the patronage machine and it's gonna hurt some of your people and I'm not gonna pull my punches. And the Hispanic leadership says, we're behind you. That's a very moving story. And instead, we got this stuff about when did Lisa LaMaster... Did she pay you for that opinion? Uh, that's we, what we get. No, no. We, we had lunch about a month ago, and <laughs> that's about it. But, and I think we split the check. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but you were never on her payroll. Ever. Ever. We've so, been friends since 1989, thanks to Tom Dunning and Ray Hutchison. They introduced me to her during the, the uh, single-member district issue. So here's this really, really important story. And instead we get this crap about the damn letter did he write this letter does renee really feel this way about mike miles or is it all part of a machiavellian effort 
to swing support for a guy who we need to run out of town. I mean, that's the narrative here. That we're, is. We're also losing, you know, we've talked about the top staff. What has not been discussed is about the staff that Miles has brought in at the executive directorship level, the assistant superintendent level, the chief of st- chief of schools level, who, in my book, on a, on a scale of 1 to 10, they're probably doing a 7 and an 8. Uh-huh. They're doing pretty good. And you're a tough grader. Uh, and I'm right out there with, with parents picketing a school uh, last week because they're sti- I'm still going to be on Miles' case and his staff's case when, they, when parents are are shut out and not, this, yeah. and this has all been tough for teachers what a lot of teachers are not seeing is that the reason your principal is is crazy every day <laughs> is because the, your principal is getting stuff from a trustee that it's not it's not mike miles calling up the principal and saying pick on all the teachers today it's that the principal is scared to death because he's getting all this stuff from headquarters but he's getting contrary stuff from a, an interfering trustee if people want to understand miles a little bit better read the book leverage leadership by bamrick uh, i've been reading it and it makes me understand much better what's going on in the classroom with principal development, with data, uh, data-driven data instruction. I'm really beginning to understand it a lot better. Great mm-hmm. book. It's going to be hard to fit that into a 90-second Channel 8 spot, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> yeah. but we'll give it our best. I, I yeah. want to see the story when Coggins' report comes in and there's no nothing. There's nothing big. There's nothing that he went out. He was sent, out, he was sent out to kill a moose. And when he comes back with a porcupine, I want to see Brett put that on his plate and and, uh, get out his his knife and fork. Get the crow out. (laughs) Yeah, that's right. Well, Jim, I won't see it. We're we're almost done here, and I'm on my way to Santa Fe. And I'm going to Galveston. (laughs) So I got to stay? You got to to be the one to figure all this out this week. Yeah, okay. Well, well, uh, the report comes this week. We'll see you next weekend. Uh, Jim Schutz, Eric Celeste, get off my lawn. Thank you, Renee Martinez, for being here. Loved it. Get off my lawn. KNON 89.3 FM in Dallas and Fort Worth, the voice of the people. Business owners, tell KNON's listeners about your business. You can put your business or event on KNON. KNON currently has space available to run announcements for you. Tell KNON's listeners about your goods, services, nightclub, concert, or event. Help keep the voice of the people on the air while putting your information on the air. KNON's been named the number one radio station in Dallas by both the Dallas Observer and D Magazine. Put your business with Dallas's number one station. Call now for more information at 214-828-9500, extension 227 or extension 233. For more information, go to KNON.org and click on the Run Spots on KNON page. It's a great way for your business to support community radio while letting more people know about you.